peace, love, power to the nines. Welcome to the first mass call, Black Men Build mass call of the year of our Lord, 2023. So happy to have each and every one of you all here. Um, it's an incredible, incredible uh, time. Um, and it's beautiful just to uh, really be able to fellowship with one of you, with, with each and every one of you all um, at least once a month. And this occasion in particular, um, because we're honored to have Dr. Matulu Shakur joining us in a discussion with Dr. Hiram Rivera. You all know Hiram. Um, he's got his doctorate in, 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 in street knowledge. And uh, we're very excited about this opportunity to have this conversation with a brother who has dedicated the entirety of his life to the struggle and, uh, and hear from him and uh, also hear from each and every one of you all. So this is an incredible, incredible moment. And I'm just really excited to be able to um, welcome each and every one of you all to it. We still have people filing in. Don't forget to drop where you're calling in from into the chat. If you are using the chat, make sure you're, you're hitting um, uh, everyone and not hosts and panelists so that everybody can see the brilliance. I'm gonna go over a few of the rules we have for every single mass call. They're very, very simple. We believe that we can disagree without being disrespectful. And so while I don't imagine there's gonna be much to disagree with on this call, we want to make sure that we're respectful to one another in the chat, respectful to one another in our discourse and show that we uh, as an organization can engage in conversation without being confrontational at all times. We also want to stay on the subject. So uh, if you are, um, if we are speaking about the work of Dr. Shakur and the acupuncture clinic, there's no need for you to be dropping anything about cryptocurrency in the chat right now. We we, that's not that this is not that mass call you know we may have a mass call about um your new venture that you want to launch but we want to stay on subject here and make sure that we do that um throughout this call so once again on behalf of black men bill we want to welcome every single one of you all to the first mass call of the year featuring dr matulu shakur freed um, from the gulag with the work of many people on this call you know we have been um, consistently beating the drum under the leadership of Hiram um, uh, about us never leaving behind our political prisoners here and abroad. And uh, we're really, really grateful, not only that we have them home, but that we have the opportunity to be able to dialogue with them today. So we're going to get it going. We're going to get right to it because he's going to be joining us. And so we're going to be shifting the agenda to make sure that we can accommodate his schedule. Um, my name is Phil Agnew. I uh, right now serve as a co-director of the organization and very excited and honored to be able to facilitate this conversation today. As you all can see, it is not dark in my background. Um, so that means I'm not on the East Coast and uh, I will keep where I'm at a mystery because that's what I am. I'm a man of mystery. I'm on the West Coast. So um, appreciate everybody. Uh, we're going to get to it. We start every single one of our mass calls, and we've been doing this now since June of 2020, um, with our values. Our values ground the organization. Our values are in a, a way for us to align ourselves around principles that are higher than just the things we're swimming in on the ground. They are the beginnings of a North Star for us. And so uh, to do that, we have our incredible organizer from Atlanta, Georgia, um, Edima Ufat, who's going to um, lead us in a reading of our values. Uh, what up, everyone? Uh, values, man. We are Black men organizing each other to serve our communities, to be students of the history, to be critical thinkers, truth tellers, and to and teachers in the present and develop social, economic, political, and spiritual tools necessary to evolve and secure a Black future. Um, I'm gonna start off with our first value. We are critical thinkers. Uh, we are curious in this moment. We are together. We are coming together to take an active, responsible role in freeing our communities. We are transforming to meet the moment. We are bonded with black women and black people in the fight for true freedom. Um, black people who choose to fight for the enemy 
or use our struggles for personal and financial benefit need not apply. Well, you <laughs> you looking more mysterious than me, man. My camera's bad too. I can't even talk. Man, thank you. Straight out of Atlanta. Adima been with us all the way since the beginning, organizing in Georgia. Um, and so we're, we're really grateful for you to be able to read through our, um, yeah, 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 yeah. People with, people with bad cameras can't grow, throw stones. So I'm going to just chill on that. Uh, but deeply appreciative of the work that Adima has done and all of the organizers around the country. Um, as you all know, we have chapters all over the country where an organization that's rooted in um, in, in building members and building a base. And we're proud to have the work that we're doing um, across the country, Atlanta, Miami, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Atlanta, New York, Columbus, Detroit, Memphis, LA. And we're gonna be in a city near you by the end of this year due to the work of our organizers and um, uh, Kedron and Berto. So you'll be getting a call from them. I wanna make sure, Kedron, I need to get you up here too. Hold on, make sure that we have all our team up here represented. Um, as we transition to this conversation, there's no better person to shepherd it, um, to shepherd the dialogue than the person who is gonna be following me on the call. Um, Hiram Rivera is someone who I consider uh, a mentor, um, not an elder, right? Um, but someone uh, who has consistently, since I've been in the movement, has consistently had a moral and political core um, that I've always respected, sought to emulate, and has consistently ensured that Black men build, live up to its principles in our support of political prisoners, in our observance of Black August, um, and in a, a continued commitment to make sure that we don't leave our political prisoners behind. And so there is no better person to move us through this conversation um, than Hiram Rivera. So we're gonna move to him. My request is, uh, to let him engage in this dialogue as he's prepared. And then we will have time for potentially some questions to come up through the chat. Uh, take out your pen, take out your paper, make sure you're listening um, because what we're gonna have right now is some jewels. And so um, thank you, Hiram, for doing this. Cool, thank you, Phil. I really appreciate you. Love you, brother. Uh, you the nines. Um, the nines. Here who came through to hear, listen to Dr. Shakur. This is a really huge, huge honor for uh, myself and for everybody here. Before we get to the doctor, just want to, you know, introduce them really quick um, and remind the folks, right, that the eras of the 60s and the 70s were a time of war, a revolutionary war, anti-colonial struggles in the continents of Africa and continents of Asia, Caribbean, Latin America, but also a war by the hands of the United States government against Black people in this country the murders of our leaders, the murders of, of activists, men, women, and children from the times they were brought here on those boats all the way through the eras of lynchings and on through the Black Power Movement. It is in that context and in that time that Dr. Shakur is born, is raised, and is doing his work. And so born in Baltimore, Maryland, raised in Queens, New York, Dr. Matu Shakur was a conscious member of the New African Independence Movement and the Black Liberation Struggle since the age of 15 first organizing locally around community control of schools in Brooklyn, and later nationally as a founding member of the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, a committed defender of our people. Dr. Shakur not only put his body on the line to protect the lives of those New Africans during the infamous attack at the New Bethel Church by the Detroit police in 1969, but worked to save and transform lives of those struggling with addiction in New York City almost a decade later through the Black Acupuncture Advisory Association of North America, BAM. Dr. Shakur is a soldier of the people, has lived a life of revolutionary discipline and revolutionary struggle, a life of sacrifice and service to the new African nation and all oppressed people around the world. Indicted by the empire on charges of expropriations of armored cars and the liberation of Asada Shakur, Dr. Shakur served way too many years behind the walls. And through the tireless work of so many people, the New African People's Organization, the Malcolm S. Grassroots Movement, the Shakur Squad, comrades, activists, and most importantly, his family, Dr. Shakur was released. During Black August, I made a statement, no struggle in the history of the world has ever been successful leaving their people behind. Ladies and gentlemen, the general is home. So please do your cameras, give your warm welcome to Dr. Matulu Shakur. 
Doc, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, brother. Right on, How right on. How you doing? Uh, first, let me just, you know, greet you. New African greeting. Free the land, brother. Free the land. Land, oh. land brother. Oh. How you it's feeling? Good. It's good to be home. You can't underestimate freedom. Right on, right on. Really right on. cannot underestimate freedom. Right on, right on. But it's so uh, rewarding encouraging to see the new African man establish a forefront of liberation organizations in this period. It hasn't always been disorganized. Right. We had mass demonstrations we had rallies, teachings, we had marches. But one of the weakness in the man, the black man's role in this liberation was the ability to put together administrative predictability from the black man. The black woman is out there kicking and scratching. In the last 10 years, the black woman has shown herself to be politically astute and sufficiently organized to hold back the vicious examples of oppression that we are being confronted with. We owe them a continuing effort to put together structures, infrastructures to hold back and back them up as they move forward into the next years, decades coming. And it's coming. We as black men was the number one target to these races. We were the number one target, not because our fat black asses was worth anymore, but because they determined that if they undermine the black man, they undermine the nation. In the discussion of where do we go forward, we could not find a more clear example a genocide waged against an individual type than the struggle to su suppress the black man from his genitals all the way up to his brain. And every technique they use to undermine our confidence, our courage, and our ability to set our spirit free was an attempt to undermine the whole black nation. So black man, we are now in a position with the black woman holding up the sky, beating back these slugs, holding on waiting for us to come. They're waiting for us to come. Stop this horizontal aggression that's primarily done by black men, African men, killing our race, killing each other, killing our culture. The black man has an obligation, an obligation to get side by side by, with this great black woman. And let's get this party started. Right on, right on. Doc, you lived a whole life of struggle. You lived a whole life under the leadership of both black men and strong black women who developed you from a, from a teenager through all your years, through all the different organizations that you've been a part of. We got a lot of brothers and sisters on these calls who come on.
who are first joining into a struggle for the first time, some of them who are a little more seasoned, but a lot of folks who are looking to develop, looking to get involved. And so if you can, just share a little bit of your story as, as a young man, as a 15-year-old, what brought you into the struggle for New African independence and more importantly, the struggle for all oppressed people across the globe? There's no magic. It wasn't magic. If you were born in America in the 50s and the 60s, you already realized that these crackers ain't playing. You realized there was something missing in your core where you felt fear every day. Fear for yourself. Fear for your mama going to work in the white people's home. Fear for your father and uncle not to get castrated. Fear for your partner and your cousin running from the Lord to go down south. Fear for them to hang in him. Fear is a hell of a motivator. And we know what that says. Either you fight or you flight. And in the, in the, in the period, we had dynamic leaders. Excuse me. These leaders had different tactics in order to subside that fear into a place that they can exist as a semi-normal human being. We fought every day in the churches, every day in the schoolyard, every day in the schools, transportation from one place to the next. We had to fight. So some of us became teachers. Some of us become construction workers. Some of us became taxi drivers. Some of us became street organization. So we all put a piece of the struggle that we were going to engage in. Knowing that it, that engagement was going to lead to some shit, lead to some things. Right. And right. so we sacrificed. And I was one of them guys. Right. I was one of them guys. And Doc, you know, if one of the organizations, if not the organization that you that you were part of, was Republic of New Africa, the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, yeah. right? Uh, and the Republic of New Africa was very clear, and it's very clear in its in its understanding that there is no salvation for us as New Africans in the empire. Um, for you as a young man, why did you choose the Republic of New Africa? What was it about the concept, the politics of the Republic of New Africa? That led you to do what you do and ultimately lead you down the direction that you that you went on. There's always more than one thing to create a, a phenomenon. Um, I was searching. I was, for real. I was searching for an alternative to the Black Panther Party. And why not was that? Because, not because I didn't love or try to help build the Black Panther Party in South Jamaica, Queens. My brothers and sisters was all in the Black Panther Party. I was a little stubborn. And the definition of what we want still was not clear to me. The 10 point program was very important. And most of my teenage years, I worked on a free breakfast program, worked for independent school system, fought against police brutality work with welfare rights and all of that. And that was important stuff. I got up every day trying to get that work done and get other people to get with me 
to get that work done. So it wasn't an opposition to the position of the Black Panther Party. I was invited with Brother Herman Ferguson, Sonny Carson, and some other brothers and sisters out of Queens in New York. And we went to Detroit to hear the founding convention of the Republic of Africa. We were invited there by brothers and sisters from Detroit. In fact, Brother Gaidi and Brother Omari from Philadelphia, years before that, mm -hmm. we had Black Power conventions every year for three or four years. We all masked up and come to a city and talk about what we're going to do and what will we do. And it was mainly black men, mainly black men. Now you had some firebrand sisters and they came and took the chauvinist abuse, but they was up in their chest out, fingers in the air, talk about what we should be doing. So we was at a meeting to pull together a convention. And uh, it was at Amari Obadelli's house. Who was with me? Brother Umtahari was with me. Sonny Carson, Arthur Harris. Herman Ferguson, and some few other brothers and sisters. We were sitting down, and we was like new African meat to be. We've been in the meat for about 40 hours, seemed like, trying to get it right. And around 10 o'clock one night, a group of people raided the house, started shooting in the house the proficiency of the Black Legionnaire. They were ready. They moved so swiftly and effectively to beat back the armed attack. And we said right then, we down with this here. We knew Africans. Black Legionnaire. So we found something not in opposition to the Black Panther Party, but something that gave us that spirit that we was in that fight. Right. Right. You know, I was talking, I was talking to the elder here in Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia, home to a lot of revolutionaries. Uh brother Dr. Uh, Muhammad Ahmed, formerly Max Stanford found a revolutionary action movement. That's right. And he told me that uh, you were his acupuncturist and he sends his greetings and his, and his uh, welcome homes. And so looking at that, at the moment of, uh, in a period of, uh, of heightened revolutionary struggle, no struggle, Doc, you chose medicine as a primary way of fighting back and fighting for your people. And so can you speak more about how you came to, to, to use medicine and why you chose acupuncture? I didn't, I, I didn't choose, the condition chose us. The condition chose us. You used to be able to walk down the streets in our neighborhoods and to see a dope thing shooting up would be rare in the mid sixties. In the mid sixties, these years makes a difference. They make a difference because the consciousness of the people flip flop so fast during that period of time that we lost control of our respect. Wow. 
but the the church, the Christian church, the Moabites, the nation of Islam, the gang bangers, street corner gangs, we suffered, our hearts suffered when our brothers and sisters came back from Vietnam, all strung out, quinine bodies from the cut of the hair on. We suffered because we lacked any control over that genocide. But like we do, the brothers and the sisters start taking brothers and sisters and putting them in basements, cleaning up the basements so that the sisters and brothers could cold turkey. Right. Feed them. Feed them. Wash their face, wash their hands. Do everything we could to save their life. And that work felt good. That work felt real good. And I heard you mention, I've heard you mention before in other interviews that during that time where the government was flooding our communities with these drugs and with the heroin and all that, the chemical warfare, as you put it, that a lot of that work of treating those folks who are struggling with addiction fell on revolutionary organizations, fell on these community organizations or even religious groups like the Nation of Islam to do. Um, and that at that point, that also wasn't just about, you know, saving lives, but it became a point of organ, a site of organizing because y'all were also giving them political education. Y'all were also, right, not only building them back up physically, but also building them back up mentally. And that also became a threat to the state. That also became a, a, a problem, right, and a threat to the empire. Um, That's why you got to give honor to Brother Max Sanford. Mm -hmm. He organized where it needed to be organized. He organized in the streets with a high level of political consciousness where we were looking for symbols. He was in the background putting together structure. Free the land, free the man from this addiction. Capitalism plus dope equal genocide. Right. I don't know. We, we believed back then during them Black Power conventions and them rise in 64, 65, 66, 67, all over this country, we believe that we're on the cornerstone of freedom. Right. We said we was gonna be free in 73. Look how far off we are. I tell everybody today, what I seen in 2020 was just amazing, amazing flush of our people, particularly our people building a bonfire so everybody could get warm to that revolutionary state of mind. The love that we should have for each other. We felt something like that back then. Drugs hindered that. Drugs, drug selling, drug addiction was used by us to fight off post-traumatic stress from the terror we lived in. No excuses, just fact. The terror of not having a job, the terror of your wife disrespecting you, the terror of you disrespecting yourself, the terror of the look in a child's eyes at his or her disappointment with you, with us as a people. We talk about manhood. We talk about new African manhood. It was on the verge of extension. 
So when we came across a concept of health that can be used to intervene in this chemical warfare, we jumped on it with all fours. And we began to learn the difference between the state's health care and people's health care. So the principle of health care for the people became a very important aspect of our manhood because we could give something to our community. We could make a difference. And, and as a result, as a result of all the work that you was doing, primarily through Banner and all that, the state started to come after you, right? And they started to say that that uh, that Banner was was associated, that you were associated with uh, expropriations and, and and other indictments and charges that were that were coming at you, saying to support the work that you was doing uh, with the children in Mississippi and across the globe. And a lot, like you said, that the the, the conditions chose you. Can you speak to, you know? Ultimately, what were the conditions that led you to go underground? Uh, the conditions that led uh, so you know, few of the other uh, comrades of yours and, and folks in the movement, and not just black, but the Puerto Ricans, the kind of, right, to go underground and take up uh, a different form of struggle against the state at that time. Well. the opportunity to participate in our struggle was the choice of sacrifice. We knew it would be rough. We knew it would mean full participation. But before we went underground, we were with the people. Right. We were with the people. Right. United States versus Blah, blah, blah. United States versus blah, blah, blah. Uh, Panther 21, Wilmington 10, New Haven 17. Everywhere you look, there was a, a postcard of how the state were taking people who were community activists and send them to jail for many, many years for nothing but an alleged conspiracy. That was the tactic used by the FBI to establish a, a foundation for counterintelligence operation. Right. The things I'm talking to you about now even though we call it struggle, they was calling it low intensity warfare. Counterintelligence was low intensity warfare. The explanation of counterintelligence, counterintelligence of warfare was that the Participants, in most cases, didn't know they were at war. The government was very clear that they were at war with us who were then 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. Right, right. The files, the FBI files are clear. When you can look back and see Jarrell Wayne Williams being followed and then report on Jarrell Wayne Williams to J. Edgar Hoover every six months when he's only 15 and 16 years old. They spent their money on their enemy. 
they demanded their agents concentrate on their enemies. That's why they had to kill Fred. Bunchy Carter, John Huggins, Zayn, Shakur, Lumumba, Shakur. Right, right. This is a war. And when you're in war, you treat your prisoners a certain way. You teach your prisoners a, a certain way so that anybody who believed in him or thought the prison made a rational sense or rational narrative for their sacrifices, you wanted to kill that possibility. And it was a people's war that they didn't know they were involved in until it was too late. Because by the time they finished, dissembling our organizations for basic human rights, our petitions to the world for basic human rights, we have been involved in so much horizontal aggression, territorial unintegrity. We have been involved in disrespect by foreign nations. We had destroyed the concept of allies, we lost faith in them, they lost faith in us, so we could not unify when it was the appropriate time to do so. We could not use the international instrument because we use an ideological divide to prevent what should happen in the interest of the whole. The question of a nation is a question that we all want to have to answer. Right on. That's right. That's right. And Doc, I don't want to. I want to keep you too long, so I got a couple more questions. But sticking with the the topic of prisoners and specifically our political prisoners, um, you know, we do a lot of there's a lot of work that's been done to free the political prisoners. A lot of them have come home. There's those that are still behind the walls. And so if you can just tell the viewers here, if you can tell us here, what are the, the most important things that we on the outside could do uh, for those brothers who are still trapped behind the walls? What does that support need to look like for our political prisoners? And what do the folks on the outside need to commit to uh, in order to make sure that they feel supported on the inside and that we bring them home? That's a very good question. Cause I sure waited a long time. But well, you ought to come on with it. <laughs> I got a lot of brothers back there. Yeah, yeah, they are. Some of them without the political astuteness to organize second level support for their situation. Most of them over 60. Most of them been in jail over 25 years. Mr. Mandela was in jail for 25 years, 27 years. And these brothers, those are the people I know not saying the sisters not in this situation. But these brothers, A steady, holding strong for the wind to come. The wind is now for them. The wind is now for them because mostly they're standing on their last breath, fighting illnesses that the community has to deal with every day. And they have to deal with it inside the box of an oppressed society. That's not to say you don't have human beings functioning behind the walls there. 
because you do. And you do because you carry yourself in a certain way, you are distinguished from being a criminal. And so those who are looking at the distinction realize there's something wrong with this picture. Why has this person been here all this time? But the worst critique is, where's his people? Don't nobody love him? This man been here all this time, ain't nobody come to see him. He's fighting a, a deadly illness. And you, became, you become shamed if you are part of that person's legacy and know he's dying on the limb. No commissary. Now you got letters you can't, they read it before you read it. And if you can't read it, tough, tough on you. You can't touch children. You can't touch children. You can't touch children. It's the easy thing to organize for. A children's day to our political prison. Right, right. You know, folks, folks, please, you see the links in here for the Jericho movement. Uh, get involved, write those letters to your political prisoners, right? They need to hear that correspondence. Definitely donate, the links are in here to support not only Dr. Shakur, but support all our political prisoners who are still behind the walls and need that support from us on the outside for everything they have sacrificed for us. So let's keep that going and let's keep that, that moving. Um, you know, one, one, one last thing, Doc, I, again, I wanna keep you on here too, too long. Um, I've written letters to you throughout the years when I was, I was given the mandate of learning who, at a young age, who Dr. Matul Shakur was to make sure that all the young people I worked with knew the name Dr. Matulu Shakur. Uh, and I spent years trying to live up to that, that mandate I was given to make sure everybody knew who Dr. Matulu Shakur was. Um, and receiving those letters from you, you know, whenever you would write back, not knowing if you knew you would write back uh, and getting that letter gave me, I mean, filled me up with so much joy, so much excitement uh, that, that I, I can't put it to words. And even as I'm talking to you right now, it's, it's the butterflies, it's the nerves, it's, it's, it's you know what I'm saying? It's like seeing uh, uh, one of your biggest idols. And so this, this last question I want to give to you is, now that you're home, now that you're finally out, right? What brings you joy? What is bringing you joy these days um, that you're finally, you're finally out, you're finally home with your family? What is bringing you joy in, in these moments? My family has done without me for 38 years, even more. And uh, the sacrifice of not seeing them has affected them, I'm sure. To have them all together, helping me and uh, working by my side and I by their side is very joyous. I'm looking forward to what the future brings. I, 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 every time I ride around out here, I keep saying, man, this is a beautiful country. The sun is shining, the, the, the trees are swaying. Man, it's fantastic. Right. So the nature, nature is a companion to freedom, and I'm down with it. I don't know. Down with it, and I thank all of y'all. If I haven't said it before, or if you haven't heard it before, I thank everybody that has done anything to help me get out of prison. And I hold up your banner 
because I know it's not easy. But it's, you know, it's a glorious struggle, though. It's a glorious struggle. I wouldn't be nobody else before I am with sacrifices and all. Oh, no. And to hold my mother in my arms was one of the greatest things that I could think of since I've been free. So uh, I'm not going to hold you any longer. <laughs> I got love for y'all. And uh, you love yourselves. You know, we got the obligation. We got to get it. It's on the man. It's on the black man. Not on no chauvinist black man. Because we need everybody in the fight. Yes, we do. Everybody in the fight. Get your feet wet. Yes, we do. God's going to love you for it. Hey, I know. I know. All right, Doc. Really, really appreciate you. Really appreciate you making the time, speaking with us, brother. Um, thank you for all of your sacrifice. Thank you for everything you and your comrades have done for all of us and the generations to come. Um, you know, I hope you have a, a, a good night and welcome home, brother. Free the land. Free the land. I share, I share. Oh, man. I Free salam. the land. Thank you. If y'all can, please drop in the chat. Um, Anai, some love for Dr. Shakur. Phil, if you can put those flies back up that you had, you I will. Posted. Yep, I'm about to. I'm about to do it right now. Um, I want to thank um, Dr. Shakur, Baba Watani, Sister Taliba, who has dedicated years. Met Dr. Shakur when she was a student and he was at Coleman, who has dedicated time. Couldn't be on the call today, but made sure that she brokered the relationship for Dr. Matulu to be here on this call. I'm about to share my screen here for everybody to see how you can donate. And I'm going to give you all some time yeah. to do it now. Do it now. www.matuluShakur.com slash support. Do it now. Put it in your phone and make this donation now. I hope everybody on this call was listening to everything that was said. He said people on the inside were asking, where's his people? He talked about war. He talked about sacrifice. He talked about health. He talked about unity. He talked about love. He talked about our sisters holding up the sky, our sisters on the front lines, our sisters that for generations have been in this movement at the forefront, bearing a chauvinist masculine way of our being that we were taught, but still remaining in the movement remaining in love with the movement, in love with our people, in love with the struggle, in love with us. He said, it took us a long time. I don't know if y'all heard that, if that hit y'all as hard as it hit me. It took us a long time, a long time to get this brother and many other sisters and brothers that have been released in the last few decades and years. And we gotta do better, y'all. We have to do better. The conditions chose us. The conditions chose the doctor, chose his comrades. The conditions continue to make choices and the, con con the conditions are choosing us right now. At the beginning of the call, we spent about 15 to 20 minutes asking, who do you love? And I'll ask you all this again as we begin to wrap up this conversation. Who do you love? Who do you love enough to transform yourself? 
who do you love enough to stop sitting on the sidelines being an armchair radical and revolutionary and to get into this fight for the future of our people and the future of this world? Who do you love enough to stop with the posturing, to stop with the faking, but to really dedicate yourself to the sacrifice that is required to win this for our people? Who do you love enough to do what is required to transform ourselves to meet this moment? Who do you love enough to study, to show yourself approved? Who do you love enough to dedicate yourself to improving your physical condition, to improving your mind, to dedicating your time? Who do you love enough to love yourself, to love the people who are in this struggle? Who do you love? Do you love yourself enough to struggle? What are you willing to give on behalf of the movement? This, these brothers and sisters have dedicated their lives to be here in this moment. And more is required of us. Who do you love enough to answer the call that this moment, the conditions are going door to door, choosing people. When are we gonna answer the call? It has already been laid out for us very, very clear by Dr. Matulu and Dr. and Dr. Hiram. I actually now I'm just calling you that. The conditions have been laid out. What are we waiting for? What are you waiting for? Nobody is coming to save us. Nobody is going to do this work for us. The time to sit and wait and see who else is gonna do something has long passed. We're asking you all today to join Black Men Bill. Email Kedron at blackman.bill. He'll put his email in the chat. Email brother Roberto at blackman.bill. He'll put his email in the chat. Build a hub, serve our people study together, build a circle in your city, build the organization that is required for this moment. These people have sacrificed their lives for each and every one of us. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to them. We owe it to the people behind the walls, even still today. We owe it to our future generations to answer the call, transform ourselves, build with our sisters and brothers and siblings, build organization, build an infrastructure that is larger than us. We are not doing it for the internet. We're not doing it for, the, for, for clout. We're doing it for ourselves and for the future of our people. We cannot continue to have these sisters and brothers on these discussions telling us about what they did to get us to this point and not reward them with the spoils of war, the spoils of war that are transformed people, the spoils of war that are transformed families and communities and neighborhoods, the spoils of war that is an empire in decay every single day because of our labor, because of our work, because of our sacrifice, our time and our commitment. The spoils of war, they must be rewarded with the spoils of war. And that is and only is the complete reversal of the path that we're on right now. And the irrevocable transformation of our people our trend, and our communities. And so once again, I wanna thank each and every one of um, you all that had a hand in um, making this call possible. I wanna also ask that you all donate to our work. I'm gonna share one more slide. I'm doing double duty, so excuse me. There's one more slide. There are a number of events that Dr. Shakur, that Dr. Emoja are a part of. Here's the information. Our incredible communications team, Aaron, Steve, Jeremy. It didn't see. change, Bill. What is, what is it? Oh, it didn't change? It didn't change. Oh, okay. Well, that's why I shouldn't be the... Hold on. Hold on one second. I got flustered. One second. Okay, it's about to change. Boom. And, and so there's a number of events that are forthcoming. We are going to send this in the email, follow up email to you all, as well as a link to um, 
continue to support Dr. Matulu Shakur, a link to the Jericho movement to support all political prisoners, and a link to these events that are forthcoming. So we want to thank Dr. Hiram, want to thank Baba Watani and Dr. Matulu Shakur and every single person, Taliba, who had a hand in um, bringing this event to bear. And we cannot let this be a one-off event where we relish in the sacrifices of people who came before us, where we tranquilize ourselves in the small victories um, and in these small moments. We have to be steeled up for the longer fight that is before us. Um, it is no small feat to rescue one of ours from their clutches. They have no desire to release any of ours from behind the walls. So we have to continue the fight so that those people in those prisons don't have to ask, where are your people at? I thought you were a part of a movement. I thought y'all was about to revolutionize and transform the world. Why ain't they came back to get you? So we've got to make them feel us, y'all. And so I want to just say peace to the nines, love to the nines, power to the nines, all the damn time. Dare to struggle, dare to win. Dare to struggle, dare to win. Peace, love, and joy if you're willing to fight for it. Thank each and every one of y'all for coming, and we'll see y'all next month.